if everyone could stay muted until we open the floor for questions, that would be great. I also welcome you to type your questions into the chat and I can relay those to Dr. Ocean at a natural break in her presentation. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Allison Ocean is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Well Cornell Medical College of Cornell University. She's a medical oncologist and attending physician in gastrointestinal oncology, solid tumor division at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Well Cornell Medical Center, and practices medical oncology at the J. Monahan Center for Gastrointestinal Health. She's a board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and medical oncology. Dr. Ocean's primary interest is in the biology and treatment of gastrointestinal malignancies. She has published numerous peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, and abstracts, and is an active member of several professional societies, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology, American Association of, for Cancer Research, and the Pancreatic Cancer Research Team. Dr. Ocean is currently leading numerous clinical trials investigating radio-labeled antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, oncolytic viruses, and targeted therapies in pancreatic cancer. Dr. Ocean is the founding medical advisory board chair of Michael's Mission, a nonprofit focused on improving the quality of life for colorectal cancer patients through research, education, and patient support. So thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Ocean, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jessica, for that warm welcome and welcome everybody. It's really nice to see um, everyone here and some familiar faces um, and taking time on a Saturday to um, be with us and learn about clinical trials, which is such an important subject in um, the treatment of anybody with cancer, especially a rare disease like pancreatic cancer. And um, I'm gonna share my screen now so I can, um, so you can see my slides. Okay, one second. And then I'm gonna get in here and go here and go here. Okay. Um, Give me two seconds. Okay. Sorry. Hold on one second. I don't know why it's doing this. Let me go back. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, everybody can see it, right? Yeah. All good. Okay. Perfect. So thank you again for inviting me today and, and happy to be here with all of you. I represent today. Let's Win Pancreatic Cancer, which many of you know about already. Um, I formed this organization with a, pa a patient in 2016, a patient who was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and was told that she had no treatment options, get, get her affairs in order. She was going to die in six months and uh, she couldn't be helped. And one treatment was worse than the next and uh, just got continual messages of negativity. And she was an executive in the PR world and came to me and said, we have to change the conversation about pancreatic cancer. Why would anyone want to fight if there's already a sentiment of resignation from the second they hear about their diagnosis? And together we enlisted uh, some very special, powerful people in the cancer space. And we created Let's Win Pancreatic Cancer, which is an online platform that enables doctors, scientists, and patients to share fast-breaking information on potentially life-saving pancreatic cancer treatments and clinical trials. And everything that's published on Let's Win is available in both English and Spanish in real time. It's everything is vetted and reviewed by medical experts so that you know that everything that is on that site is um, real content, active content, current content, and, um, and we collaborate with so many organizations like Craig's Cause and PanCan and Luskarten Foundation. So um, we are really um, 
eager to introduce that Let's Win to even more people. And um, thank you for letting us be a part of this presentation today. So the goal today is to talk to you about clinical trials. And this is honestly something that when I'm seeing a patient for the first time, I'm the one that hang it up a lot of times and patients don't even know to ask about clinical trials, which is, which I think is, is, you know, we have to, that's what we have to change that patients have to know to ask about clinical trials and what they are. Are they an option for that patient in, in while they're going through therapy? Um, and, you know, all the facets of clinical trials that that are important for patients and caregivers to know about. And so I'm gonna try and take you through uh, the, you know, the clinical trials 101, what you need to know, and a little bit about the background of trials and what they, what they are looking for, the different phases, et cetera. So um, clinical trials are an important part of pancreatic cancer treatment options. You may or you may not know much about them, what's involved or how to find a trial. And that's why uh, our learning objectives today will hopefully address these issues. A clinical trial is a prospectively planned experiment for the purpose of evaluating potentially beneficial therapies or treatments. In general, these studies are conducted under as many controlled conditions as possible so that they provide definitive answers to predetermined, well-defined questions. And we'll talk a little bit about what these questions are in clinical trials. We also use the word endpoints in clinical trials. Those are the, what we're trying to answer in, in doing a clinical trial. I'm now gonna show you a brief video about what is a clinical trial that gives us an overview about the talk and the next, um, few slides that I have after that. After the video, I will pause to take on some questions about the video and just some general stuff, but the, the meat of the talk will be later on. Um, and so, but we can take a break right after this to answer some initial questions if you have any. Let's Win is here to help you better understand what a clinical trial is and why one may help. A clinical trial is a research study conducted on patients. It can test treatments, screening methods, or disease prevention techniques. If you join the clinical trial, you may be given the latest treatment for pancreatic cancer. Most pancreatic cancer trials do not involve placebos. Participants receive either the new treatment being tested or standard treatment. Clinical trials are conducted in phases. Phase one tests the safety of a new treatment in a small group of patients. If the treatment is safe, you can move on to a phase two trial. Phase two tests the new treatment in a larger group of patients. Researchers look at the safety of the new treatment, side effects it may cause, overall effectiveness. If the treatment is safe and benefits the patients, a phase three trial can be designed. Phase three trials include a large group of patients and compare the new treatment to an existing one to see which works best. Some patients receive the standard treatment and some receive the new treatment. Scientists then compare the results to determine which is more effective. If a new treatment is shown to be effective, it goes to the Food and Drug Administration for approval. Clinical trials are an important part of advancing the science of treatment. Without clinical trials, there would not be any new drugs. There are rules and standards for clinical trials to protect the patients taking part, and you cannot be included in a trial without your consent. Participating in a clinical trial can help you and patients in the future. Okay, gonna come out of here and go back to my slides. Let me just get out of here. Okay. Perfect. 
Okay, and I wanna open it up to any questions that people may have right now. Um, it's a little early, but, um, and if I know I'm gonna address the question that you have, um, I, I will, you know, obviously cover it later on. If for some reason you don't, your question doesn't get answered at all during this talk, uh, please feel free to contact the organizers and we can try to our best to answer the questions offline. Jessica, just let me know if we have any questions. We do have a couple questions in the chat. The first one is from Paul. Um, in phase three, are patients randomly assigned to standard or new treatment? Excellent question. I will cover that. Okay. Um, can a patient be enrolled in a clinical trial at any stage? Yes, and I will cover that as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might do a couple that were submitted like in the registration link. Um, someone is interested in targeted alpha therapy. Do you know if there are any clinical trials specifically looking at that? We'll save that to the end because that's very specific. Sounds good. Um, if you're looking to investigate a clinical trial with the PI or a nurse coordinator, what medical documents are important to have with you? Excellent question. Uh, we'll cover that as well. Okay. Um, maybe we could continue with the, the presentation then because we might cover a lot of these. Okay, perfect. Through your slides. Perfect. So I wanna start with myths, myths about clinical trials. We hear, and patients hear, and caregivers hear a lot of statements made by doctors, made by other patients, made by relatives about clinical trials. And I'm gonna list them here and go through them. And then I'm gonna to try to address these later on in the talk. So myth number one, not all participants get treatment. Some get a placebo instead. Myth number two, clinical trials are only for when patients have exhausted all other options. Myth number three, if you enroll in a clinical trial, you will not be able to get out of it if you no longer want to participate. Myth number four, Clinical trials are dangerous because the treatments are untested. Myth number five, clinical trials only help future patients, not current ones. Myth number six, the health information of clinical trial participants becomes public knowledge. Myth number seven, a clinical trial, trial requires a large time commitment. We know that clinical trials are essential for the advancement of the field of cancer. And the sad reality is that less than 5% of patients at all participate in clinical trials. It is what is necessary to advance the field. In addition to the low numbers of partic participation in clinical trials, there are multiple disparities that exist. Black patients comprised 8.2% of trial participants versus 12.4% of cases in pancreatic cancer. Hispanic patients represented 6% of trial participants and 8.5% of cases. Women are also underrepresented. Why do these disparities exist and how can we encourage diverse enrollment? As I go through the talk today, I will try to address these questions as well. There are many, many barriers to why patients are not enrolling on clinical trials. And I'm gonna list some of them here. They're on different levels. There's patient level, there's physician level, there's system level, there's hospital level, there's administrative level of so many reasons why the number of patients enrolling on clinical trials is so low. And I wanna start with the patient level. These are 
potential accrual barriers, awareness of a trial as even as a, as a uh, treatment option, understanding of what the trial participation involves, concerns about side effects, education about a particular trial phase, education about a particular treatment, fear of dis distrust, being the guinea pig, instead of trusting in your physician recommendations. History of discrimination in medical research. Inconvenience of trial logistics, travel, time, number of visits, financial burden, unrealistic inconvenient protocol requirements, unrealistic restrictive inclusion or exclusion criteria. Some patients who sign up for a clinical trial and don't enroll or, or are not accepted they often don't try again to get into a trial. So all of these reasons are very, very well known reasons on the patient level as to why our clinical trial enrollment is so low. There are also physician factors of why uh, clinical trial enrollment is so low. Physicians are concerned about potential toxicities from study treatment. They're concerned about the comorbidity conditions, the comorbid conditions of patients, what other medical problems the patient has, and will this experimental medicine uh, fare, fare, how will it fare against their other medical conditions? The physicians themselves have a lack of awareness of accessible clinical trials. There's a lack of access to clinical trials, even for, for physicians for their patients, for their own patients. Physicians own perceptions about the relevance of the questions being addressed in the available trials. There are some physicians who feel that a trial is not, quote, worth the time because of the question that they're trying to answer. It's very, Enrolling in a clinical trial and taking care of patients in a clinical trial takes a lot of time. And there is a lack of time in busy practices to discuss trial options and to take care of patients on clinical trials. Some physicians fear that they'll lose their patient if they refer them to a clinical trial that's at a major medical center far, far away from where they were originally getting care. There are concerns about trial suitability for an individual patient, whether they would tolerate it, whether there would be a benefit for that patient. Some patients, sorry, some physicians may believe that the patient shouldn't be offered a trial because they wouldn't be adherent to it, or they wouldn't, or they're not competent enough to understand it or to comply with it. And then there are trial factors themselves that are barriers. What's, what's inherent to the actual clinical trial. Dissemination of up-to-date knowledge of available and ongoing trials and how to access them. We, as a medical profession, do a poor job of dissemination of this information. We need to, we are getting better, and obviously organizations like Craig's Cause and Let's Win and PanCan and Luskarten and others are really, at the forefront of getting this dissemination of knowledge out there and about available ongoing trials. But in medicine in general, we are not great about it. it. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money actually to publicize these trials um, and to do it in a way that is not um, coercive or um, biased. There's a paucity of clinical trials for a specific patient population. Uh, for instance, patients that who are, have pancreatic cancer that have liver dysfunction or kidney dysfunction, or they're elderly above a certain age, that some certain clinical trials restrict these, these uh, specific patient populations. There are also currently, the landscape for clinical trials changes so rapidly. There are new trials that open and close and open and close, and they, deal with very, very specific histologic and or molecular selection of treatments based on a patient's tumor. And these are very, very rare subsets. And I think that a couple of pe people that I know are on this uh, talk right now could speak to the fact that they do 
have a rare um, finding about their, their cancer, but they are lucky to have found a clinical trial that targets that rarity. And for that reason, they have been from it. There is a need for innovative and attractive clinical trials that efficiently evaluate novel agents. And we need to deal better with the burden of research investigations and visits that go on in clinical trials. It is an extreme amount of time and work, but it, it, it's important, it's necessary, it has to happen and it has to grow. And we feel that if the more people know about the ins and outs of clinical trials, then, and they pass that information on to others, then that will lead to increased enrollment in trials and awareness about clinical trials. When you participate in a clinical trial, your health is very, very closely monitored. Uh, this reminds me of the time when I was um, in medical school, actually, and you know they um, were on the wards in medical school, and the, the patient who's in the hospital has a ton of doctors looking after them. And then the medical student, of course, looks after them too. And I remember I had a patient one time who was not on a clinical trial, but just a patient as a medical student. I went into the room to take an exam and, and to take a history and do a physical examination. And the patient was so annoyed that I was the 10th person coming into the room to ask them the same questions and the same, to, to do the same thing. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to what to answer to this person who was obviously sick and, and annoyed that the, the 10th person was coming into the room to ask them about their medical history. And then I went, went and spoke to my attending and my attending told me something that I always carried with me. Um, and I went back and told the patient, the more people that lay eyes on the patient, the more, the better the care will be and the more likely that their questions will get addressed and that they and that things that are not apparent to one person may become very apparent to someone else even a medical student so when i went back to tell that patient that reason they they a light bulb went on and said you know you're right i really want as many people as possible involved in my care and so that's what i that's what we mean when your health is very, very closely monitored. You have your attending physician, your, your, your primary oncologist, you have research nurses, you have data managers, you have other uh, physician members of the team um, constantly looking at your chart and looking at your case to, to add value to your care. So that's, that's a very, very important advantage of clinical trial participation. This means that any change in your health is noted quickly and can be treated. So why clinical trials? Why do we need to do this? The most definitive clinical trials are the most definitive, definitive method to ultimately determine treatment effectiveness. Other designs to, to evaluate medicines have many more biases. One cannot determine in an uncontrolled setting whether an intervention has made a difference in someone's outcome. It has to be a controlled setting. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means about controls and um, at different stages of a clinical trial. Clinical trials help us understand whether a finding is correlative or whether it was truly causative for that condition. It also helps us determine the incidence of side effects and complications from an experimental drug. When you're on a clinical trial, you may receive a drug or treatment protocol that will be more effective than your current treatments. You may receive a, a drug or treatment protocol that will be more effective than your current treatment. You are not guaranteed to receive a treatment that is more effective. And that is the whole point of clinical trials. That is also why some people are fearful 
of a clinical trial, that they may not be getting the, a treatment that is more effective than current treatment. But most clinical trials at the start of someone's treatment journey always include standard of care and then add to standard of care with experimental agents. So at a minimum, a clinical trial in the upfront setting must include uh, standard of care therapy because we know that standard of care therapy has a proven track record, record to help patients for whatever outcome the drug was approved for, whether it was for overall survival, whether it was for reduction of side effects, whether it was for uh, living longer until the disease gets worse, whatever the trial endpoint that led to approval of the drug, you know that you're getting that at a minimum when you start out with a clinical trial. Not everyone qualifies for every trial. There are trials that target specific stages of disease. Participants may or may not have had prior treatment and that every trial is different in what they require and what they, what they look for in inclusion and exclusion criteria. Participants may need to be able to tolerate the treatment. You have to have a, a good enough performance status to be able to go on a trial. You have to be able to withstand the known side effects of the treatment. The treatments do not cost extra, but there are many other expenses. There could be many other expenses, including travel, more testing, or, or extra time missed from work that has to be considered. It is all also important that new treatments are tested on everyone. This goes back to my slide about disparities. How can you accept that a, a, a treatment is standardized for everyone if not everyone participated in the data collection for that clinical trial. Clinical trials need to include people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. The elements of clinical protocols are listed here. They, are, they have objectives, they have endpoints, they have primary objectives and secondary objectives. For instance, a clinical trial, the primary endpoint may be overall survival if it's compare, comparing one regimen to another. We wanna know ultimately which treatment provided a longer overall survival for which treatment. There are secondary ob objectives or endpoints. These could be um, quality of life. They could be a pain scale. They could be side effects. They could be safety. They could be, um, there are many, many different secondary endpoints that can be a part of a clinical trial. Clinical trials have selection criteria, inclusion and exclusion that usually deals with someone's medical history, the lines of, of treatment they've already had, whether or not they have other medical issues, et cetera. So those are the, what involves with the inclusion or exclusion criteria. There is always a therapeutic intervention in a clinical trial. It involves a dose, a schedule, a mechanism, or a route of delivery. Not all clinical trials are medicines. Some are devices. Some are um, interventions that involve counseling um, or behavioral interventions. It's not always medicine that is on a clinical trial or a, a drug. It can be any number of interventions. There's extensive clinical workup and follow-up assessment for people on clinical protocols. We need to define the toxicity criteria of, of certain interventions. Within a, a drug clinical trial, the toxicity criteria are very well defined and there are dose modifications for medications on clinical trials. So if a patient starts at the first dose level of a clinical trial and encounters a certain toxicity, we grade that level of toxicity as grade one, grade two, grade three, et cetera. And the grading of the toxicity helps us 
uniformly determine whether or not that person should have a dose reduction of or dose modification of the clinical drug that is being tested. Clinical protocols look for efficacy, whether it's clinical efficacy, pharmacodynamic, like how the drug interacts in someone's body, the level of the, of the drug is what we mean by ph pharmacodynamic, Qu QOL, quality of life. So we look at different efficacy endpoints in a clinical trial. And obviously there's a ton of analysis and interpretation that goes into a clinical trial, primary and second endpoints I mentioned earlier, and a lot of correlative studies. There could be um, people who have participated in clinical studies know that, that we take a ton of blood tests, urine tests, and, and other tests. And those extra blood tubes and urine collections, et cetera, are being done for correlative studies. So other studies that can help us understand the, the way the drug works, the, whether, whether the drug hits the target that it's intended to hit, uh, whether, whether the drug reaches a certain level in someone's body in a certain period of time, all of these questions are being answered by these correlative studies. Clinical trials are essential to compare treatments. It is a fundamental principle that groups must be alike in all important aspects and only differ in the treatment each group receives. That's the only way we're gonna know if a treatment was particularly effective in a population. In practical terms, this means comparable treatment groups alike on the average. That is what is essential in a clinical trial. We, someone asked earlier about randomization and what that means. Randomization in a clinical trial means that each patient has the same chance of receiving any of the treatments under the study. There are different kinds of randomization in a clinical trial. Sometimes it's a one-to-one -one randomization, meaning that the randomization is not chosen by the doctor, it's not chosen by the patient, it's not chosen by the pharmaceutical company, it is chosen by an unbiased computer that is deciding which arm the patient will receive, which treatment the patient will receive. If it's a one-to-one -one randomization, the computer decides you will be receiving arm A of the clinical trial, or you will be receiving arm B. That's a one-to-one -one clinical trial randomization. Some clinical trials are weighted randomizations, meaning they're two-to-one randomized. That means that for every patient that enters into a study, you have double the chance of receiving the experimental agent than you do receiving standard of care, a two to one randomization. And the Precision Promise platform, which is ongoing now for first line and second line treatment of pancreatic cancer under the um, clinical trial platform, Precision Promise PanCan is an adaptive randomization method. And what that means is that for each of the arms of the trial, there is different randomization percentages. For example, on the Precision Promise platform for first-line therapy, patients have a 70% chance of getting standard of care plus the experimental agent and a 30% chance of getting standard of care. So it's heavily weighted to getting the experimental agent in addition to standard of care. That means that seven out of 10 patients who go on this clinical trial in the, the first time that they're treated for pancreatic cancer have seven out of 10 of them will get the standard of care plus the experimental agent. Allocation of treatments to participants is carried out using a chance mechanism so that neither the patient nor the physician know in advance which therapy will be assigned. This is if the trial is considered to be a blinded clinical trial. When it's blinded, it means the patient doesn't know, the physician doesn't know, only the study sponsor knows what treatment the patient is getting. More about blinding. 
Blinding is necessary to avoid psychological influence. So patient may, who goes on a clinical trial may not want to go on a clinical trial because they're, they're fearful that they're going to get they're not going to get the experimental agent. They're going to get the standard, but they're not going to get the experimental agent. So they, if they knew that they weren't going to receive the experimental agent, they may not want to continue to participate and they may drop out, which is a patient's right to do that. But there, you can see how there are avoidance factors that could be involved if the study were not blinded. Blinding does provide for fair evaluation of outcomes. Now I'm going to talk to you about what to expect in participating in a clinical trial, what to watch out for, and the different phases, a little bit about the phases of, of, of clinical trials as well. In, in qualifying for a trial, we need to know someone's stage of the disease, whether they are stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. So the stage of the, of the disease is very, very important. Most clinical trials are only done for stage two and higher. Uh, stage one disease for pancreatic cancer, very few trials exist. They may be preventive trials or vaccine trials. If someone is treated for pancreatic cancer with surgery uh, and or chemotherapy and they finish their treatment and then they could go on to a prevention type of clinical trial, which is in investigating a vaccine or uh, some kind of prevention strategy to prevent the cancer from coming back. The health status of a patient is very important for a clinical trial. We need to know that someone can withstand the, the study intervention. What prior treatments a patient has had fares significantly in deciding on a clinical trial. And lastly, what mutations the patient has either in their blood, which is considered germline or hereditary, or what or mutations that exist within the tumor itself, which is considered somatic mutations or tumor specific mutations. So all of those factors are really, really important to decide if a patient can qualify for a trial. I want to highlight here now that your first go-to about a clinical trial should be your doctor. Your doctor, your oncologist should know about available clinical trials. If you are living in an area or going to a smaller practice where a community practice that where there's one oncologist that's treating every type of cancer and doesn't have access to clinical trials at that office where you're being treated or that hospital setting where you're being, your doctor probably knows how to find out about clinical trials close to where you're going. And if for some reason they don't know, then you can use the following resources to find out about clinical trials. Clinicaltrials.gov is the National Cancer Institute's clinical trials website. It is the oldest one. It is the, the one that is that most people go to first. Every clinical trial has to be listed that is conducted through, um, you know, correct practice has to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. But the problem with clinicaltrials.gov, and I encounter this day in and day out, is that it is not updated in, enough frequently. It is very hard to navigate. It is hard to understand. Sometimes I even have a tr trouble understanding the ins and outs of a clinical trial the way that it's listed on the site. And if I'm having a, I'm an expert in trials. And if I'm having trouble finding out the ins and outs of it, how can I expect a patient or a caregiver to know about this? So that's why all of these pancreatic cancer organizations that are listed here have made it an important goal to break down the barriers 
to finding a clinical trial and have actually developed extremely informative and helpful clinical trial finding services. And we have, uh, so clinicaltrials.gov, I'm just gonna take you through each of these quickly just to show you what they all are. Um, so you'll, this is the home of clinicaltrials.gov. Um, you can put in the condition, pancreatic cancer. Let's look here. And let's say you know that you wanna do a vaccine. Okay. Or yeah, let's anything. Um, and, it, and then you just do search. You can limit it by country, you know, US, Australia, UK, whatever. Um, and I'm just gonna do search. So what comes up right now? How can I do studies? Vaccine, pan oh, I spelled it wrong. Look at me, oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> Um, let me go back. Uh, there's nothing for pancreatic cancer um, in vaccines. Imagine that. Okay, let's try this now. Here we go. Okay, 117 studies have come up for vaccine and pancreatic cancer. So the first thing you look at, completed, terminated, terminated, not yet recruiting. So this is not helpful. Why do I, you know, I want to know something that's going on right now. So you have to go into recruiting and apply that. And that knocked it down to 20, from 117 to 20. So now there are 20 trials that are currently accruing on this platform for vaccine trials. And they list the locations of where they're being done. They list uh, what the intervention is, the condition, and actually the trial name. So then you can go into each of these trials and then read more about it. So this is a neoantigen peptide vaccine strategy in pancreatic pa patients following surgical resection and adjuvant chemo. So this is what I mentioned as a prevention trial after someone has had surgery and chemotherapy. Now imagine you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and you go through surgery and uh, sorry, you go through surgery and then chemo, but no one ever told you that you should be looking into a clinical trial for after the fact that after you've been treated for this. So that's why it's important to ask your doctor about a clinical trial on day one of the diagnosis, no matter the stage, even if it's early, even if it's late, ask about a clinical trial because there are trials for all settings. I have tons of patients who I see in second opinion who never were ever told about a, a clinical trial at any point during their treatment journey. And so how would anyone know to go on this clinical trial and what it's required and whether or not they're eligible if they don't even know about it at the time of their surgery? So there are very specific recruitment things that needs that people need to know about that they kind of have to plan in advance for about this trial. So that's just one example, okay? Um, I'm gonna go back now to, uh, uh, here, let's go back here. Um, I wanna show you Let's Win's Emerging Med Clinical Trial Finder. Let's go here. So this is ours. Um, and this is, remember, this is pancreatic cancer specific. Whereas clinicaltrials.gov is every um, disease, heart disease, um, you know, uh, anything going on by the NIH, not just cancer. So it's it's everything. Okay, so welcome to Luskarten and Let's Win's clinical trial matching service. No matter where you are in your pancreatic cancer journey, we encourage you to explore which clinical trials may be available to you by using this free unbiased matching service. So you can do this through speaking to someone and that may be good for people who are um, not so computer savvy. Um, it's also available in, in Spanish and the times are here. Um, or you can begin your trial search now by answering a bunch of questions and then they match based on where, you know, what, what you, what you ask. So let's say I want to do um, early detection, cancer prevention for my relatives. Let's say my my family has is part of a hereditary 
syndrome like BRCA or um, ATM, and I want to look for a clinical trial for prevention for my an early detection for my children that are that, because they're at risk for pancreatic cancer. So let's see here, um, women, like if it's men, women, it usually doesn't matter. Um, let uh, let's see if it's and then you type in one o one two eight. You know, let's say where I live. Okay, search and trials come up. So this is metformin as like an anti a diabetes trial, um, a, a vaccination trial for BRCA carriers. All this is coming up. So you can see and where this is going. So this is much more defined to a patient with pancreatic cancer than is um, clinicaltrials.gov and a lot more easy to navigate. Okay. I want to take you now to um, the next one. Okay. Clinical trial. This is PanCAN's clinical trial finder. It's important to know all your options. And then this, are you a patient or a caregiver or you're a healthcare provider? So there's different questions they ask based on who's looking for the trial. So search clinical trials. Let's say, let's say you want to, you're the patient. Okay, we'll go in here and let's get started. Um, let's look here, hold on. Um, okay, so anyway, it gives your, you have to create an account, so et cetera, et cetera. So, and they ask questions like, your zip code, how far are you willing to travel, all this stuff. They also have a telephone option too. That's very, very helpful. So th this is another example. I, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all this, but then I also wanna um, bring up the Craig's cause one. And this was mentioned earlier, and this one's in English and in French. And um, maybe I can turn it over to, um, Jessica, quickly, if you want to just mention a little bit about your clinical trial finder. Sure. So <laughs> our clinical trial finder. Um, again, Tell me what to click on. Should I go in here? Yeah, if you want, I can share my screen, but whatever's easier. Oh, okay. Okay. It's just a couple of clicks anyway. Yeah, this is fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so we accept submissions through this survey. And again, we're just asking pretty generic questions, your name, where you're from, what area you're interested in participating in trials in. Um, so there's there's usually a lot in, in the big urban centers, um, not so many in the, the smaller areas. So I would take that into consideration. Um, we ask if you've had genetic testing done, it's okay either way, there are trials available on either side of that, but it does, um, influence your eligibility. So it's it's great information to have if you know you have certain mutations. Um, as Dr. Ocean has highlighted, we'll, we'll ask for your stage, but there are trials available for any stage. We just need to know what, what stage we're looking for. Um, if you've participated in treatment already, um, that again influences which trials you're, you're eligible for. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty simple to complete this survey, and then we do the the challenging work of of those less user friendly databases, <laughs> and get back to you with the contact information for the trials that you are personally eligible for. Uh, so yeah, great, thank you. No okay, so and we're we're gonna wrap up now, and I'm gonna show you one last video. Um, let's see here. Okay, next. Okay. If you or a loved one have pancreatic cancer, you might want to consider participating in a clinical trial. There are many new drugs and treatment combinations that are being tested in trials and you may get access to the latest science. Although the idea of finding a trial can be overwhelming, but Let's Win is here to help. The first step is to find a trial. 
you should start by asking your doctor if you are being treated at a major academic center or by a pancreatic cancer specialist, your doctor will know about different clinical trials. If your doctor does not know about current trials, you can look for one on Let's Win. Our site includes descriptions of many different trials and is easy to navigate. The page is organized by topic, so you can find trials for your stage of the disease, ones that use already approved drugs and add an experimental drug, and others testing completely new drugs. We have also partnered with the Lustgarten Foundation and Emerging Med to create a helpful tool that asks specific questions, including your diagnosis, stage of disease, your location, ability to travel, and more. These questions help narrow down possible trials for you. Put the link for this tool at the top of the page so you can easily find it. The next step is to apply for the trial you found. You will need your doctor's help. Start by sharing the information you found. Your doctor will help you decide if that trial is right for you. Each clinical trial has very specific criteria for participating. The researchers conduct the trial look at the stage of your disease, your overall health status, whether you have had any cancer chemotherapy drugs you have previously been treated with, and for some trials, whether you carry certain genetic mutations or whether your tumor has certain mutations. If a specific trial is not right for you, your doctor may know of a different trial that would be better. It's important to ask your doctor what drugs are given during the trial. Some trials include placebo medications instead of the experimental drug, but you will always get standard treatment in a clinical trial for pancreatic cancer. In many instances, there are no additional costs to participating in a clinical trial. The trial sponsor and institution running the trial may cover the medical costs. However, there may be extra related costs, such as travel. You will want to ask these questions before you start a trial. Applying to join a clinical trial does not guarantee that you will be chosen. But remember, even if you are not accepted for one trial, you may be eligible for another. Room share, hold on. Okay, hold on. let me get through this. Okay, so just, these links are here again and we can provide them for you later. Um, I just wanna just, before I finish, highlight um, our Pank chat, which is a Twitter chat, an international chat that happens uh, on Twitter that's, was started with Let's Win. It's held on the third Tuesday of each month. It features doctors from researchers, scientists, patients, caregivers, huge amount of stakeholders that are dealing with pancreatic cancer, um, as well as Lusgarten, PanCan. And I just wanted to point, highlight Pank Chat because it, it is a frequent place where people talk about clinical trials. And um, a lot of patients talk about trials that they're on. Uh, doctors, we're allowed to post about clinical trials. Um, we're allowed to let people know what trials have opened. Um, just because you post a clinic, cl clinical trial at one institution um, doesn't mean that your patient can't participate at, at a different institution. So it's, it's really a helpful forum. Um, even if the topic is not about clinical trials in pancreatic cancer, that month, there's always talk about it. So you can access it through at Let's Win PC with the hash, hashtag pank chat. So in conclusion, clinical trials are a necessary component of cancer drug development. There are discrete developmental phases of clinical dr drug development, often with some endpoint overlap. The phase one trials, although there are many different types, are typically answering questions for of safety, drug safety, or intervention safety. For it's one of the first times it's being done in humans. Phase two trials are focused on efficacy. Does this drug have efficacy against this disease or this endpoint or this 
target. Um, usually they're not, most phase two trials are not randomized to a placebo, but some of them are. Um, and then phase three trials help determine benefit over standard of care. And um, those are, sorry, those are the gold standard for clinical trials because those are the ones, everything, every medication that anyone takes has been proven to be effective in all phases of testing of clinical trials, phase one, two, and three. And so it is what is needed for any new drug to be developed. We must work together in the fight against cancer. Please encourage patients and caregivers to consider treatment on a clinical trial. Let's win together. Thank you so much for joining us today. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was so informative. Is it thank okay you. if we move to some questions? Yes, absolutely, I'm gonna... Okay. Uh, um, exit this. <laughs> um, sorry, let me just see here. Okay, good. Um, I have one to, to kick us off, if it's okay, about yeah. randomization. Excellent. Hi. Okay. Um, now. <laughs> Go ahead. Now. Um, so you were saying that like when a patient is accepted to a trial, if it has two arms or maybe more than that, um, it's usually quite random as to what arm of the trial they will be placed into. But I find when we do these clinical trial searches, oftentimes on the, the very like multiplex trials where there's many, many arms, mm -hmm. <laughs> a patient can be eligible for one arm and not another. So is mm -hmm. that taken into consideration when the randomization is done or does that patient automatically become uneligible for the whole trial? Excellent question. If, if a trial, the goal is to try to capture as many patients as possible. Mm -hmm. So if a patient is only eligible for a certain arm of the trial, then they go into the running for that arm and they're included in that arm and they wouldn't be in the running for the one that they're not eligible for. Okay. So they definitely look into that and that is taken into consideration. Okay, that's good. Um, I'll move over to the chat. We have a question from um, Alicia who's asking, um, how does a certain drug get selected to, to um, become a clinical trial? So, there is a lot of preclinical work that is involved with drug development. So um, all of these researchers are looking at different pathways of how the cancer grows, um, whether it's um, gene mutations that cause the, the tumor to grow, or whether it's um, the tumor cells know how to get a good blood supply and so they can sustain their growth. That's one pathway. So there are different pathways that encourage tumor growth. And so scientists are looking for ways to block these pathways. And the drugs that they choose are, or drugs or interventions or blockers or whatever you have it, antibodies, they're, they're, they're all trying to decrease cancer growth and to block a certain growth pathway. And so they figure out that a drug can inhibit cancer growth. And once they figure that out in the lab by testing on cells and then testing on animals and then testing on humans, ultimately, that's how they introduce a drug into a clinical trial platform and system. All of it is tested heavily before in the laboratory, first on cells, then animal models, and then human models. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into the research before the clinical trial is even started. So that, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, what stage, uh, I guess we kind of answered that. There's a question asking what stage do you have to have um, in order to join a trial? Yeah, right. So you have to, most trials are for more advanced stages, but, um, but there are, like I said, prevention trials for earlier stages. So um, at any stage, you should ask, 
could I be participate? And what's interesting is also that some trials are registries actually. So they're not necessarily interventions. You're not gonna get a, a drug per se, but you're gonna be part of a database. And that's important too, because they wanna follow how people are doing with whatever stage or condition they're, they're dealing with. So they become part of a registry so that we can get information. And once we have a conglomerate of thousands of patients in a registry, then you can look at all of that data through supercomputers, through artificial intelligence, and you can try and hone in on patterns of, of different things that clue you into, oh, well, why did these 1500 people live longer than these 1200 people? What was it about their case that, that enabled them to live longer? And then the computer picks out the details and the patterns that exist in that population. And that clues scientists and researchers into other questions they should be asking. So that so it's also important to participate in registries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have a question about at what point after diagnosis trials should be considered. And you mentioned that it, it should be a day one um, right. question. So can you like go over why that's important? And I guess I'll like add a follow-up to that is I think it's getting better, but it seems like the more treatment that you've participated in before, it, like investigating trials, the fewer trials you're eligible for. So, yes. That? So the, if someone's had a lot of treatment and standard treatments and they, and they need something new to treat their disease, most trials at that point that they're eligible for are considered to be phase one trials. And phase one trials are, it is the first time they're being tested in humans. And the goal of the trial is safety. However, for a phase one trial, they, it doesn't mean that it's a, a waste of time because you can actually look into certain phase one trials that are based on different tumor pathways. So if you know that your tumor has a KRAS mutation, let's say, and 99% of pancreatic cancers carry a KRAS mutation, there may be a phase one trial of a KRAS blocker that is ongoing and they don't care how much prior treatment someone has had. So that you just need to know that you look at, look at a cl clinical trial, a phase one clinical trial, look more into the science of, of the drug and why they're doing it and to see if that applies to you rather than just like any applies to everybody. Thank you. It is an exciting time now because there are a lot of trials that are going on in the immunotherapy space. I feel that in pancreatic cancer, for the most part, it, a single immunotherapy drug will not be enough. That if, if you need a trial, if you want to do a trial that includes immunotherapy, it usually requires more than one agent mm -hmm. that's targeting the immune system in different ways in right. combination with chemo, actually. Usually they don't work just an immunotherapy agent by itself because mm -hmm. pancreatic cancers are not considered immunotherapy hot cancers. They're immunotherapy mm -hmm. cold cancers. Right. The immune system kind of doesn't care that you have pancreatic cancer and they're not sending T cells to fight it or whatever. And so all of these immunotherapy trials are, are trying to activate your own immune system to fight the cancer. And mm -hmm. so if you want to look for an immunotherapy trial, look for one that is a multi-agent trial. That's my, my first recommendation. And then um, I think that I'm, I like, I'm interested in, in the meta cancer metabolism. Like why, how do cancers get their energy supply? And how, how do they, like, how are they getting their food to grow? And so I like, I'm intrigued by um, drugs that um, try to get at the energy supply of, of the cancer. So mm -hmm. I think that that's an interesting area to look into. Um, 
I, for people who have even stage four, who have been, who have responded well to chemo um, and have gone into remission, and there are many who do that, at that point, I would be looking into vaccines and there are stage four vaccine trials. So that's something to consider if, if you've had a very good response to therapy. Um, uh, what else? Um, those are the, 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 um, those are the, mostly the, the, uh, some of the stromal inhibitors are interesting too. Like the stroma is the, is the hard scar tissue around the cancer that mm -hmm. acts like a deterrent to chemo. And so there are medicines that are in trials now that are trying to digest the stroma so that the chemo can penetrate better into the tumor. And so I think that some stromal agents, um, fibrinogen mm -hmm. inhibitors, that's part of the PANCAN precision promise trial. Those look promising. Um, so something like that. Um, so you've mentioned Dr. Ocean, how important it is to know as much as you can about the makeup of your tumor. Um, in general, and when like investigating trials, um, can you give us advice or point us to like which member of a patient's healthcare team um, should they approach to achieve that molecular um, genomic testing? Mm -hmm. um, certainly the doctor or the nurse practitioner or PA that is involved, they all have the ability to order those tests. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of bigger institutions, they're automatically done actually at the time of pathology. They just have to request the answer, you know, to get the re reports done. Um, a lot of the companies that do liquid biopsies now, um, those are blood tests that, that you can do to get mutations, um, to find out the mutations because a tumor sheds into the bloodstream and you can pick up those mutations in the bloodstream. And that's called a liquid biopsy. A lot of these testing companies actually send mobile phlebotomy to the, the person's home to draw the blood. So you don't have to be near a big center to, mm -hmm. to get it done. You can call, and they have international um, presence as well, these companies. Yeah, for sure. Um, so do you have an understanding of like, if, if a biopsy was taken and it's being stored in a hospital, what's the shelf life on that before it can no longer be sent for genomic testing? Um, a, a, a biopsy that is fixed in, and preserved mm -hmm. in, in a pathology lab, as long as it's there, it's kept for a long, 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 long time. The issue is not how long it, it will be good for the issue is is there enough tissue or not for all these tests and a lot of times there's they exhaust the specimen when they do a lot of testing and there's not enough, and someone needs a new biopsy in order to get the information so that they, they're stored for a long, long time it's just that the issue is the tissue you want to make sure that you have enough tissue okay that makes sense um and in the case of phase one trials, how is the target therapeutic like value determined? Like if they're specifically looking at safety, um, how does it get decided like if it should move on to phase two? So they already know by the time it starts phase one that this is a blocker or a, or they know what the goal of the drug is, is for. Mm -hmm. And they know that in the lab that it killed cancer. They just don't know if it, at what dose to give it in humans, right? And, and is it safe to give it in humans? So once they, it goes through phase one and it meets its endpoints of safety, they know that it's safe to give in humans. And, now, and then it goes into phase two where it's specifically looked at to see if it's as efficacious in, in humans against the cancer as it was in the lab. Okay, makes sense. Um, I think the rest of the questions that I currently have in the chat and what was submitted in the registration link are like very individualized, they're case by case. Um, so before we like dive into those, would anyone like to just raise their hand and ask any more like more general questions? 
Floor's um, open. <laughs> It's hard to do a, a general recommendation now, but I do want to point out that there is a through Cancer Commons and something called X Cures that there is a diet clinical trial available for patients with pancreatic cancer. And it's a food delivery service where they're trying to figure out if they deplete the diet of a certain protein, I can't remember what it is, but uh, then that could that be helpful in, in um, helping the, the, you know, preventing the cancer from growing. So it's a diet intervention trial that's being done through Cancer Commons and X Cures. Um, the company is called Faith, F-A-E-T-H, and it's an, it's a national trial. I don't know if it's international, but that is something that you can look into about a, a, a dietary intervention for pancreatic cancer. Dr. Ocean, I know we've, we've kept you past. One. Yeah, that's okay. I, I, um, <laughs> I would you rather take the more individualized I think, questions? I think it's going to be hard. I, I will try to answer some of them, um, with you offline and if we can, um, okay. but I, I, I think that the, the ones that are so, so specific, it's very hard for me to, to, to answer those because I, obviously I'm not taking care of the patient. Um, but um, if there's anything generalizable that everyone can help with, that get help with, then we can put out a, a paper for that. Okay, sounds good. All right, are there any other questions before we sign off? Uh, about between 10 and 20%. Okay, and then we just got one more in the chat asking like how long on average does trial participation go on for? Or is it on a case by case basis? Usually goes on as long as the drug is working. Okay. Um, and only one time have I had a patient on a pancreatic cancer trial where the trial stopped and the patient was responding to it, but they, but no one else, like it was, the majority of patients didn't respond, but one did. And they ended up stopping the trial, but this, they gave the drug to the responding patient. Continue, okay. They continue to do it. So as long as the drug works, they, they give it to you. Is it strictly a majority decision? Like if more than 50% of the participants are responding positively, it continues. All based on a statistical predetermined analysis of what, okay. what, the, what points they have to meet in order to declare efficacy. Okay. So each trial might have different standards. Exactly. Every patient to... has different okay. endpoints and, and how many patients have to meet this endpoint in order to for it to move to the next level. Okay. Very interesting. I think that's all of our questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, you've been wonderful. It's been extremely informative. Thank you all for joining us today. And especially thank you to Dr. Ocean. It's been a pleasure. And we'll, we'll be in touch with those more individualized questions and see if we can address those offline. Thank you. Bye. Happy Bye. Friday.